Okay, look. I've been trying to write this video for a while, and every time I get to what this essay is about, I stall out and wonder whether or not I have a point. I think it's just about me telling people about an experience most folks don't get to have anymore or don't realize they're having when they have it. So here goes. EverQuest was the first massively multiplayer online role-playing game to have polygonal graphics. It was released on March 16th of 1999 to enormous fanfare and enjoys to this day a ghost of what was once a global popularity. There were strategy guides, RPG books, conventions, toys, even Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance-like spin-offs for the PlayStation 2, EverQuest Online Adventures. It was as they said about Michael Jackson in the 1980s and the ballooning cost of real estate in the year 2023, a big deal. During a conversation about the game with a friend recently, he described it as the 9-11 of video games. He elaborated that it was a completely bad but essential part of understanding our collective experience in gaming. Its ripples through time were many and odious. While this comparison may be insensitive and hyperbolic, it is at least a little bit of a great simile. I played EverQuest for the first time during the summer after the release of its first expansion, The Ruins of Kunark in 2000. I had up until this time been cultivating a persona a big smelly nerd, and when my dad set up an account so I could play with him, I felt the hooked tendrils of my future and caring about wizards and their business wrap securely around my prefrontal cortex. I was doomed to dungeon delve. My first player character was named Pepin. He was a blonde dwarf with a healing touch just like me. I had a lot of fun playing EverQuest in the year 2000, and it became a principal obsession of mine for many years. However, this is not a story about me playing an old video game as a ten year old in my father's mostly empty house in New York at the turn of the millennium. This is an essay about me playing an old video game in my mostly empty house just the other day. In 2008, after having grown to be a longer, smarter human and somewhat popular with girls, I decided I wanted to crank life up to 11 and give the old EQ a try again after having ended my relationship with it years before during high school. I'd been playing a lot of Team Fortress 2 and Left 4 Dead with my then girlfriend, and I sought to relive the experience of wasting time with strangers. I played until my character nearly reached the maximum experience level, mostly without the help of other players. Disappointed that I couldn't capture the magic of working with others to fell triangle-faced bats in the distant hazy desert of my youth. The weight of time and constant updates had made the game of my child into a Mary Shelleyistic amalgam of old and new, so much that the smooth, baby-faced player models seemed like an anachronism against the backdrop of so much Doom-like texture mapping. Experiencing the game alongside other players, too, had become a thing mostly gone from the sparsely populated online world. With in-game currency, one could procure the right kind of NPC's assistance to cover your weaknesses and essentially skip worrylessly through the leveling process onto the newest, shiniest content. During my sojourn to this mutant version of childhood memory, I made exactly one friend who soon told me about a place where you could play EverQuest, but not like this EverQuest. The old EverQuest. The good stuff. A place where there will only be two expansions released to the server, compared to the dozens available, and one of them isn't even out yet. Yes, this server had been reverse-engineered in the free time of several EverQuest likers to simulate perfectly the experience, say, a ten-year-old in his dad's mostly empty house in the year 2000 might have had. The graphics sucked. In 1999, the only reason that the game was so impenetrable was to make sure that you played long enough to give Varent Interactive money every month for the rest of your video gaming life. But, Varent Interactive is long dead in the metaphorical ground, and now in 2009, or then in 2009, EverQuest was just as hard for no reason at all. In some time flat, I was getting down with the dogmen in the sharp rolling hills of the Steamfawn Mountains. I was falling all the way off of the treetop city of Kelethon to my death. I was basking in the cacophonic rhythm of this skeleton's rude laughter. Listen to him, rude little jerk. I was snared by this free emulation of an at the time 10 year old gnome simulator. It is the year of our lord 2023 and I am still playing this absolutely dog bones horse and pony show of a massively multiplayer online role playing game. To prepare for this essay I played a lot of EverQuest Project 1999, taking a character from level 1 to 50 with no assistance from my other character's colossal wealth. Nor did I solicit any help from strangers explicitly though as we'll see an inexplicit assistance is a feature and not a bug. Additionally and for my own edification I eschewed the use of the colossally helpful Project 1999 wiki page and chose only to use Use this physical guidebook from the year 2000. The only websites I referenced were the ones listed on these pages. I expected all of them to be long gone, so for this I needed to crack the hatch on my handy wayback machine to get a good peep on the past. For species and class, I chose a half-elf bard. I picked this combination because it would land me both with a class and starting location I had virtually no experience with, thus helping me see the game from a somewhat fresher perspective. I played this music that you're hearing on loop for the entire duration of writing and editing this video. I set my desktop backgrounds to various animated loops of iconic classic EverQuest locales, being extra careful to avoid any backgrounds that contain a contemporaneous textures or player models. Why? That's between me, the therapist I can't afford, and my deceased father. I'm gonna tell you why I like this ancient plane of hollow trees and techno orcs despite its creaking skeletal form's ridiculous spite towards comfort and usability. This demi-lich of entertainment software possesses a charm beneath the cracking skin of time, and like a lich has drained me of much of my life experience on this mortal coil. I'm not even mad about it. I'm going to show you EverQuest Project 1999 through the lens of someone who knows quite a lot about the game, who has struggled for thousands of hours against its tediousness, its obscurity, and its personality. Fascinating in 
your face. I will show you EverQuest as someone that has lost hundreds of hours more due to alcoholic brain fog that has caused me to literally erase my own accomplishments. This fight earned the ire of a stupid frowning god. I will also attempt to show you EverQuest Project 1999 through the eyes of a first time player whose doughy soul has not yet been squashed into the polished many-faced diamond of a longtime citizen of Norath and its adjacent planes of elemental weirdness. This isn't a review, nor is there any objectivity to be found in these multitudinous minutes of diatribe. This game really sucks, and I love it. Let us begin with part one. Hurdle 1 to fun in EverQuest, Project 1999 will be the creation of your online persona. There are 13 playable species of adventurer, each with access to some number of classes of the 14 total available. Humans can do the most different jobs due to their high adaptability, while trolls and ogres, a pair of barely mechanically distinct species, can do the fewest on account of being tightly wound death machines who fear the written word. There are many flavors of elf on the spectrum from which to choose, ranging from small to blue to stupid, as well as Tolkien dwarves, the bipedal lizard folk, the Ixar, the tall-headed human variant, the Irida and halflings. Next, you must choose your new creature's day job. There are four kinds of wizard, three kinds of mundane combatants, three kinds of priest, and also paladins, shadow knights, rangers, and bards. Lastly, you may choose from a list of deities curated based on your species and your starting location if you even have more than one option. Despite gods in Norath being definitely real and in some cases vulnerable to player-made violence, it is always correct to be an insufferable skeptic if you can. The reason for this is that all of your choices at character creation will affect how the non-player characters of the world regard you, from quiet friendliness to violent hostility. Just like in our shared real reality, choosing the wrong deity can make even the people in your hometown hate you. Unlike in real life, this world's denizens are willing to disregard any theological fence setting and will instead only hate you for how you look and behave. Once a character is born, it gets worse. Like character creation, virtually nothing else is explained going forward. If you read the manual that came in your boxed copy of EverQuest in 1999, a common practice of most game enjoyers at the time, you would have access to a physical object that told you how to operate what was a relatively simple interface. There were buttons right there on the screen you could click. You wanted to click those buttons. Project 1999, however, has a more modern version of the interface that is reliant on hotkeys and commands requiring multiple button presses, which are only learnable in a menu that appears if you know the keyboard command to reveal it. Like a learned wizard, you are forced to do arcane science on the internet to even know how to open your settings menu. This flexible if secretive interface, by the way, is not a concession for convenience's sake. It is actually a break from the stated goal of the developer's quest for historical accuracy. No, they just haven't figured out how to make this look like this yet. Archaic as it still might seem, Project 1999's interface does have convenient features, like the creation of more chat windows and filtering capability so that one does not have to parse every morsel of extremely important information needed to survive from a single rapidly scrolling terror escape in the bottom center of their screen. Screen. The display is simple enough to navigate after spending some time clicking around. You have a bar for equipping spell gems, or in my case, songs. You can open your inventory by pressing the I key, which also shows your character's stats. There is an action window with tabs to manage your skills and basic attack functions, as well as some commonly used commands. Note the unassuming Who button that, when clicked while targeting a player character, will identify their level, class, name, species, and any guild that they are a part of. The quiet existential horror of the Who button loomed ever present throughout my playthrough, even though I almost never used it and could not remove it. Some Sometimes though, late into the night, I would select my own player avatar and click the Who button. I am Exquisite, the level 8 half-elf bard with no organizational affiliation. None of the truths I wish to know about myself are revealed. Who am I? I'm, I'm a humble half-moron singing alone, strumming my flute to an audience of silent piles of triangles. The player character runs by on some unknowable errand and is gone. The singularity of my ephemeral sense of self is known to me, and my eyes begin drifting slowly apart. The user interface prominently displays a large chat window, which by default allows your player character to speak to their local area in a simulation of a voice being carried a short distance. There are several other channels of communication you can access by typing a forward slash before the name of the channel and pressing space before typing your message. Each of these channels is displayed in uniquely colored text in your chat window for easy discernment. You can speak to your party of up to five other player character adventurers, to individuals privately, to a guild you've joined wherever they may be in the game, or to the whole zone by shouting. People are kinda weird about shouting, especially if you do it in all capital letters. You can also speak to the zone you are in through the out of character channel, which supposes that all of the insane things that come out of my cyber mouth are the words of my avatar and not myself. I feel slightly better. When your avatar materializes and you are done reckoning with all the implications made by that fact, your character finds itself resident of a Sagan-esque flatland called Norath. More specifically, you begin in one of the species segregated starting zones. You want to move and look around instinctively. You begin the game in the first person camera view, giving you a close-up look at some of the grandiest textures this side of a sandpaper factory. You can scroll your mouse 
wheel to zoom in and out of your character's skull, rotate your position and the camera by holding right click and moving the mouse, and move backward and forward or turn using the arrow keys on your keyboard. This results in what I like to call the boomer grip control scheme common to many of its contemporaries in PC gaming. It is, as most reasonable people would conclude on their own, untenable. It always changed these controls immediately. Those looking for a keyboardless traversal of Norath may opt to hold the right mouse button first and then hold the left mouse button to thrust faceward into the environment. You can jump. Dwarf men can jump and do a little roll after. Once you have discovered how to run, your logical next step might be to question the very nature of this hideous creature's existence. Whence do you walk and why? On impulse, you approach the nearest moving object, a non-player character with a light blue name and a stern, silent gaze. You see another player character run by on some unknowable errand, coming and going with such purpose that you feel emboldened to know this place as well as they must. Wandering around is the next order of business, but when that becomes more overwhelming than exciting, you glance weightily at the name of the window at the top left of your screen. The game is called Ever Quest, after all. You search the menus whose existence you have discovered by accident, filter feeding with your eyes for meaning until at last they fall upon a single, dusty piece of torn parchment in your inventory screen. You right click it, because that's what you're supposed to do with notes in PC games. Textual scrawl fills your brain pan and you have purpose. Find this guy. He will tell you what to do with your erstwhile meaningless continuance of breathless life. Each starting species in class has their own corresponding starting note, each with their own due to track down and hand that note to. Doing so rewards you with a hearty triumphant refrain from your speakers, a small amount of experience points, and a t-shirt. And you need that t-shirt, buddy. It's the first step in protecting yourself from the terrifying deadliness of the outside world. You know none of this, but you soldier on blindly into adventuredom. We must find that dude. But lo, there are no maps in EverQuest Project 1999, true to its era. The Spartan immersive design of the world is such that you could never know whether or not some object, person shaped or otherwise, has significance vis-a-vis -vis your questly endeavors, nor how close or far away that object is relative to your character. Positionality is subject entirely to player memory, meaning that learning the geography of the world is as much a part of the game as attacking green-skinned weirdos in a cave and taking their stuff. This is further underlined by the existence of the sense heading skill, which begins at level zero for every player character. To even know which cardinal direction you're facing, you must increase your skill level at detecting polar or magnetism with your mind. Starting areas are all cities full of both buildings and people, each empty inside, save for textures of varying complexity, emulating like cave paintings the simulacra of furnishing. Sometimes there's a barrel. Trapped in the veritable barrel maze of the city, you must rely on signposts, literal and figurative, to intuit where your future master waits ready to take that crumpled up starting note from your hot little adventurer hands. It takes a while, but you manage to press that note to his face, click give, and receive the cathartic alarm of success. But there's more. White text spews into your chat window from the non-player characters on moving lips. You notice a set of bracketed words in his monologue, as if to emphasize them. This is EverQuest telling you that it's time to talk. Along with a lack of indicative interface design for pushing you towards some ludological goal, there is no indication that the goals themselves exist in the first place. There is no in-game, first-personly journal to tell you what objectives you have or at what stage in your journey you currently occupy, a la one of its contemporaries like Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. EverQuest looks upon Bioshock's giant floating arrow of determinism with a hateful scowl, choosing instead the way of obfuscation. To this game's sensibilities, World of Warcraft's iconic giant yellow exclamation points above quest-giving NPCs are the gauche trappings of overly coddled modern society. This game does not tell you to play it beyond the single note in your character's starting inventory, and at no point does it force you to play it. It simply allows itself to be played. Interacting with potential quest givers is as simple as pressing the H key, causing your character to spew a robotic hail at whomever happens to be your target. You will sometimes receive a canned response or be sharply ignored, but on occasion you will receive a response with brackets around a particular word or phrase. It is up to you now to awkwardly fumble with your keyboard until you stumble on the correct combination of human words that trigger a further response from the software. You earn perhaps more bracketed words to respond to until at last the bipedal of task assigner requests an item from you or gives you an item to take somewhere else. This is the whole of how quests work in the game about questing forever. Your itinerary is not to be drawn up from a carefully manicured interface at the stroke of a key. It is to be mined from literal talking robots through brute force and sustained by taking physical notes. All this said about player direction, it begs the question, what are you supposed to do in EverQuest Project 1999? There is not some single story being told that can be categorized as a main quest like in, say, Final Fantasy XIV, a game in the same genre. Each playable class has its ultimate material reward in the form of an epic weapon, creating a sort of end goal for certain kinds of players, but even beginning such a quest for a given class is a titanic and convoluted mystery without the help of online guides and other players. Reaching a level high enough to attempt an epic quest requires months if you are sane, weeks if you are not, and that is only through constant Mortal Kombat with the denizens of the world. 
world. Still, this says nothing of the time you'll spend on the ever-abundant quests strewn throughout. Most quests don't even give very many experience points or currency, and most still don't give you very good items. Only the really long, hard quests give those. This leads the player casually into the cycle of watching their character grow stronger, deadlier, and more difficult to kill, simply from fighting monsters to gain experience points. This is known to you and many others as the grind. To get grinding, though, we have to go to a place where grinding is not just something you do on the dance floor. In order to blood quench your fight thirst, we must go out into the world and actually play EverQuest Project 1999. Imagine yourself waking one morning in sunny Freeport with a hankering, and I'm telling you, a hunger for murdering troglodytes the color of cartoon money. Additionally, somewhere out there is a big shiny mound of goblin wealth, and the only thing between you and owning it is its original owner. But Josh, you cry, your eyes fogging with the mist of frustration. There are no goblins anywhere in my cone of vision. I know that viewer. The exception of the pygmy bugbear speaking before you now, there are no goblins anywhere near here. I've got to go find the goblins. But first, you must prepare. Be sure to have enough food and drink in your bags. Pick up your favorite rusty killing implement. Don your war face and dust off your coolest burlap sack of a t-shirt. We don't need metaphorical pants where we're going. Getting from place to place in Norath is a risky endeavor for underprepared players, as the strength of the foes you can encounter even in starting zones can greatly outsize your combat prowess. Some dastardly stranger wandering the road could spike your hiney into the dirt at a moment's notice, leaving behind your mangled corpse with its belongings. This sends a sticky, fresh, and propertyless version of yourself back to where you are bound. Your bind point represents where your character is reborn after dying. By default, this is always your starting city, though it can be changed with the help of other players. Surprisingly, you can get used to reincarnation, and it will eventually start to make you mad. Character death in EverQuest not only leaves all of your stuff exactly in the certainly dangerous spot where you've just expired, but also taxes your total experience points once you've achieved your fifth experience level. Mercifully, regaining experience points in your first 30 or so levels is relatively easy with some persistence. But as you grow stronger, so grows the penalty for missteps. Foes close to your experience level and strength become deadlier. Dungeons in which you die grow vaster and more baffling arranged, and the amount of experience you lose upon death represents a greater portion of your life wasted. I've been many times knee-deep in frog guts only to be jockeyed to the Shadow Realm by some slinking amphibian and lose an entire day's worth of experience gains. There are partial remedies to this experience loss, but that usually requires you to pay a real-life stranger in-game currency to click on your body in a specific way that joins your soul back to where your stuff is sitting. That or you could befriend one, but we will talk about the meaning of friendship later in this video. Always be polite to a cleric. Even still, be sure not to leave your corpse unattended for too long. It can decay, making it disappear forever, along with any stuff you left with it. If this happens, no one will help you. Now that you understand what it's like to die, you can understand the gravity of interzonal travel. Enemies are everywhere, and they will chase you until you leave the zone if they catch a whiff of your radiating fear. Their base running speed is very barely higher than your own, meaning that aggression from a sufficiently dangerous beast means the old skull and crossbones for your character, unless you are close to an exit. The emotions generated by travel in EverQuest Project 1999 are the most compelling evidence that the game belongs not only to the massively multiplayer online role-playing game genre, but also to the genre of survival horror. As an aside, much like in a survival horror game, if you die too many times, your fear turns to anger and you turn the game off. The meatball on top of this dangerous spaghetti of world design is that travel is slow. The size of the world of Norath was mind-melting to 1999ians, but even today, traveling between disparate areas is a kind of punishing chore. If you wish to travel from one continent to another, you will have to take a boat that is on a real-life 30-minute timer no one keeps track of. Not even the game tells you when the boat will arrive. So pop a squad and bust out your collapse fishing rod, pal. You might be here a while until the video game decides that you may now play it. Be careful not to fall off the boat. Or don't. It doesn't matter. You can occasionally fall through the boat when you arrive in a new zone. I hope you leveled your swimming skill. There are safer ways to travel. Several player classes and items have the ability to increase a player character's run speed. You can be made to hover above the ground, too, or teleport between one of many somewhat conveniently located nodes accessible by classes with teleportation magic. That's right, yet again, to avail yourself of a shadow of convenience that modern games have made standard, you have to ask another human for help, and they have to say yes. If you don't know them, they'll expect a tip. This offering is always preferable to dying while legging it yourself. Always be polite to a druid or a wizard. They'll get you to where the goblins are. Encountering these goblins, literal and allegorical, will happen all over Norath. In fact, any non-player character can be considered a hateable foe at the press of a key, though some of the more seasoned guards in the starting areas of the game can be pretty hardy murder engines if antagonized. Even merchants can be made to engage in single combat, though players are not rewarded experience points or loot, regardless of the encounter's difficulty. Monsters trapped in a constant cycle of sudden existence and brutal evisceration roam the world in patches or in static areas called camps. Their strength will vary, and usually in a way that increases as players 
wander further from civilization. New players will receive some consideration for the arduous beginning of their journey, but they will still need to make sure their heads are rotationally ready for danger. As I mentioned before, there will be camps or individually wandering creatures in low-level zones that are meant to police unsuspecting fun havers. This is yet another part of EverQuest's system of punishing a lack of game knowledge. The most successful players will not necessarily be the players with the most experience levels under their guts. It will be the players who have the broadest, deepest knowledge of the dangers that lurk in the wilderness, who will be rewarded with uninterrupted playtime and continued ownership of their hard-earned possessions. Identifying threats is pretty unintuitive, however. There are no numbers or easily parsed signals to tell you at a glance how powerful someone or something is. To suss out an NPC's level of difficulty relative to you, you must target it and either right-click its body or press the C key in your keyboard to consider the target. You'll receive a system message telling you two key pieces of information. First, its disposition towards you, a monster that scowls at you ready to attack or glares at you threateningly. It will attack you if you get near enough. Anything else means that your presence will at least be tolerated. The second piece of information you receive will be roughly how difficult it will be to fight this monster via the color of the text. By default, red text means you will probably be turned into pixelated waste in short order if you step to your target, while descending levels of traditionally danger-related colors will intuit you differently. At high levels, this colored text is a lie, and we will talk about why that is later in this video. Modern video game developers commonly have the misguided notion that the games they make should be fun or at least interesting. EverQuest, however, knows what's up. The thing you are likely to spend at least half your time doing during your character's climb upward into leveldom is fighting cartoon bad guys. You do this in a myriad of ways, with blades, magic, song, or with your bare hands. If your character class likes to get comfy up in a monster's personal space, it will do so automatically by pressing the auto-attack key on your keyboard. This will cause your avatar to swing stiffly with whatever object they have in their hands every few seconds. The server will then roll an invisible die and add your relevant stats and decide if your wild flailing was effective at harming the stupid animal before you. Melee combat in EverQuest Project 1999 is its least interesting mechanic. I cannot fathom the kind of mind required to commit fully to the purely martial character classes for longer than a few levels. That sort of person must possess an iron will that scares me to my core. Press Q. Wait. Victory. Players spend a lot of time waiting in EverQuest. A character's primary resources are their health points and mana, used for absorbing damage and using magic respectively. Both of these recover on their own, but at a glacial pace that slightly increases while your character is sitting down. Spellcasting classes have a special skill tied to the recovery of their mana that seems evidently pointless, but is essential to lowering your downtime. Seated spellcasters that open their spellbook menu will recover mana a good deal more quickly. Even with this boost though, a depleted mana pool takes tens of minutes to fully recover, with hit points being a similarly slothful climb. The main takeaway from this fact is that to recover your resources from battle, you must stop playing the game almost entirely. These moments of recovery after a tense fight out in the wilderness are the closest I've come to conceding to the colossal boredom that progress in EverQuest 1999 entails. These pauses in action, though, offer two unique advantages over other games of its ilk. First, mostly, you can just do other more interesting stuff while you wait. Go touch grass. I like to go grab a drink or make a snack, which is probably what my player character would be doing if he had the ability. If my player character had the ability, he would simply not be playing EverQuest. However, this downtime is also an opportunity to socialize with any other adventurers you may be partied with. Still, I don't want to know how much silent cyber-sitting I have done for this video essay, let alone how many hundreds of hours on other characters. Seeing that number would probably kill me. Beating the red out of the enemy successfully will reward you a small amount of experience points, and whatever stuff that creature had, be it money, garbage, or useful items. Most classes, though, will Will require you to supplement or disregard completely that time-honored tradition of brawling with the aid of magic or special skills. Accessing your player's character's abilities comes in two varieties. One, your spell book if you are a caster of spells, and two, your skills menu. Being asked to figure out how to open these without the aid of visual cues should be considered a kind of war crime. To prepare abilities from your spell book, you must first buy them with in-game currency earned through adventure or through capitalism. Most spell-using classes will have access to some sort of direct damage, some way to slow down or stop a target's movement completely, and a wide selection of utility-minded effects depending on which flavor of occultist you have chosen. These abilities will make you stronger in either group scenarios where you can amplify the powers of other characters, or while solitary, using your survivability to risk taking down foes among. This path is considerably more lonely, however, and much more punishing should you make some simple mistake. EverQuest Project 1999 does everything it can to encourage player-to-player -player cooperation, and that is, I think, the root of its occasional success at being fun and interesting. I've mentioned that encounter difficulty becomes somewhat inflated as your player character's experience level rises closer to the maximum. This is because EverQuest Quest intends you to not be a friendless loser. Fortunately, finding like-minded killer vagrants is not especially hard, even on this ancient homunculus of a game client. Once you can gather your gaggle of egregious aggressors, it will be time to topple the society of some unsuspecting unplayable species. But watch out! 
Enemy creatures of the same kind tend to be social with one another, in that if one is attacked while its relatives are nearby, they will come to join the fray. While it is true that some character classes are adept at handling groups of foes all at once, many with essential roles cannot simply carve out the weakest looking individual from a pack of goons without risking their own safety. The party will need someone to pull the monster to a safe place for your squad of digital hit people so they can give it the boots. Medium style. Here we have our first example of roles within groups of player characters. Nominally the list is thus. Puller, as previously described. Tank, the guy who takes the beat down and keeps creatures from cracking the wrong skulls. Healer, keeping the tank alive and also others. And lastly those responsible for the DPS. The folks who just killed the guy. Each role is the home of several classes, making it easy to assemble a group of players who will fill them while still adding unique advantages afforded by those individuals. Some player classes, such as the druid, can even fill multiple roles. It's this ability gumbo of an ad hoc party that makes the dynamics of moment to moment gameplay interesting. Challenges can be met by whomever happens to be available, creating a unique style of gameplay from their assembled capabilities. Finding your kill rhythm with this can be quite satisfying, especially when you stand triumphant over an empty camp save for the loot gorged corpses of your enemies. The toughest monsters in Norath with the most powerful trinkets require not just one group but several. This is where guilds become a useful construct, membership to which is shown in the form of a tag floating above your head beside your name. Having such a tag adds you to a shared guild channel with which to organize and execute your plan to kill god or gods. Several of the high level boss encounters are deities of various domains. Don't dally though, there are a lot of guilds that also want to kill god and god shows up once a week in a 16 hour window. The act of waiting for one of these bosses to appear is called socking or poop socking. None shall know the hour but the attentive will know roughly the day. Unless you don't. Welcome to the chat. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Um, I've done better. And... Earthquake. Okay, well, so much for XP. Simulated server downtime, or earthquakes, facilitated by server organizers can happen at any moment, respawning every server boss at once and sending each major guild into a feeding frenzy of loot-thirsty violence. Leaders and officers marshal their forces and compete to be the first to engage a boss, trying to earn a coveted zone-wide message that confirms they have the right to party hardy with the Lord. Each instance of a boss is shared with all other players, meaning that only the sweatiest, speediest, white-knuckled keyboard cowboys will earn that yellow go-ahead. Even still, if your raiding force fails to sustain its members against the boss's rampage, it will be easy pickings for other guilds waiting in the wings, drooling over your impending failure. Still, there is something of beauty in the exercise of killing a divine power. Each group carefully curated to maximize stat improvements and available information, each positional maneuver, each mechanically parsed dumping of numerical data from third-party software. Shots are called and made. The guild's myriad members bid virtual good boy points earned from their attendance at previous encounters on one of the two or three items that, that remain on the boss's corpse. You all gather the bodies, raise your dead, and move on to the next shivering divinity. Halt! You broke one of the player-made encounter agreements enforced by server staff. Uh-oh. What's next? Welcome to Elf Court, where your guild will be judged, juried, and given suspensions from boss encounters. If you ever wanted a perfectly distilled microcosm of human pettiness, look no further than this bickering swarm of gamer ghouls. They call the discard where they argue and talk mad trash the UN, and it is hilarious. Long day at work? Time to unwind? Better simulate further the pointlessness of human civilization in your online wizard game. Speaking of depressing topics, capitalism is an integral part of the EverQuest Project 1999 experience. If you're in need of a rare item and are freshly engorged with platinum coins, head on down to the East Common Lands Tunnel. Someone there is sure to have the item you need for a fair price. Not sure what the going rate for an item is? Check the wiki. Or ask in zone wide chat, or look at this automatically populated spreadsheet of data harvested from the chat feed by someone's always logged in character. There are some who engage with EverQuest Project 1999. Mainly as an unregulated capitalist economy simulator, and I have to admit, it's a pretty fun way to play the game. After all, what is the difference between watching this number go up and this one? One is a whole lot more stressful than the other, but the other doesn't have evil frogmen. I'll take my chances, thanks. The East Common Lands Tunnel exists as a function of EverQuest's difficulty in shared world. In games where loot is doled out evenly to every participant, such a place disappears. Here the competitive nature of item getsmanship creates scarcity and therefore the ugly faces of supply and demand turn their crusty lips upward in demonic glee. I've spent literal days waiting for our air items to drop, holding a place in a literal line for stuff that is no longer in game. I have that stuff though and it feels good. This time for currency exchange exists also in the game's myriad non-combat skills available to all player characters with a little bit of capital. Players can craft armor, weapons, food, pottery, and magic jewelry and do business trading their wares. Staying on brand as 1999's premier time 
vampire. Becoming able to craft the highest quality goods is going to be a journey. Even knowing what items need to go in which container is a veiled mystery. In-game textbooks will tell you where to start, but the arduosity of discovering what combination of items you need to make something outside of that baby's first fletching kit domain is a mighty barrier. Just like with any skill, you gain experience through repetition, and as that skill grows, so does ease of crafting higher and higher quality items. Combining items has a chance of failure relative to the gap in your skill and the recipe's complexity, falling to a very slim chance once that item is beneath your talent. This item complexity is not displayed anywhere, you just have to find it or get lucky. At the highest end though, your skill is capped to a limit that is lower than the skill required to make the process a trivial success. High quality craftables also require rare or expensive materials to make. You see where this is going. It is not only possible to fail at creating something you've mastered, the greatest items made by players are unmasterable. You can spend hours, days, weeks accumulating components for something, only to fail to create even one of that item in a few clicks of a button and erase from existence those components forever. Get back in there, champ. I ain't heard no bell. Oh, and by the way, there's no in-game way to tell how complex an item recipe is. You either just fail until you give up, or the game tells you that this recipe is too easy to learn from. That's it. I guess we are at a point at which a viewer might think to themselves, Wow, this game does suck, Tucky Internet Man, but like, people just look this stuff up if it's hard, right? Well, of course they do. This is what I imagine was part of EverQuest's appeal when it was released all those years ago. Aside from whatever information Ferrant employees told players directly, this world and all its mystery was a challenge to everyone in it. A misty mountain far in the distance. What skill level you needed to be to craft Class 3 Bone Point arrows with the range stat you wanted was never on some chart in your user interface. It was something a stranger told you or put on their personal geo City's blog for you to discover through Ask Jeeves in your middle school computer lab. The collective consciousness of each active server's individual Norath had to just figure it out through trial and error. It sounds tedious, and it was, but a game like this had never existed, and people were excited to come together and build a body of knowledge for both themselves and future players to utilize. They built a community with tons of resources and data and little social customs that persist even on this foggy mirror of an emulation. This game is not mechanically rich or interesting, it's ugly to look at, it's punishing and unfair, so why bother? The people of 1999 asked themselves this too. They had an answer that made them press forward into the chunky dark. So many of EverQuest's flaws are abated instantly by the presence of other helpful players. Travel becomes an order of magnitude more safe if you have a druid or wizard friend. The harsh penalties for death are alleviated if you are in good terms with the cleric. If you lose your body somewhere deep in a dungeon, getting to know a necromancer that can summon it will save you hours of time and struggle. These are just some examples of why player experience is intrinsically connected to that of others, making the multiplayer in massively multiplayer online role-playing game the most important of those six words. The game with more concern for mass appeal will front load the user experience with convenience, allowing easy operation and ample time to learn its systems before the natural fall off of more casual players leaves only the dedicated digging deep into the more complex aspects that lay beyond. I myself played quite a bit of Final Fantasy XIV in the last three years, but because I was not forced to learn more, I had a relatively shallow experience and a stress-free time with almost no requirement that I rely regularly on strangers for my fun. They were there, sure, but the challenge wasn't the point, the experience was. The big beautiful world, the rich story, the presence of other players was a perk, not a mechanic in my baby style waddle through that game's main story content. Project 1999 gives you no option but to find allies by contrast, making it both less broadly accessible and, in my estimation, many times more rewarding. Strutting through zones in darkness without fear, armed with your lived experience, is a triumphant sensation, especially when other veterans stand at your side. There's a sense of mastery required to reach the end stages of in game content, rather than the game simply pointing to the content and saying, Do the hard stuff if you feel like it. The hard stuff is all that's here. I started my little bard with the stated goal of not asking other players for help, knowing it would not even be a little bit enjoyable. I silently strode across the plane, slapping awkwardly at Knowles, using abilities intended for group play only on my lonesome self. It was slow, repetitive, and boring. I'm going to come clean, viewer. I abandoned that character after I hit level 8. Exquisitine, the half-elf bard, died deep in the tunnels of the Blackborough Knowles, cold, wet, and alone, and his story ended there forever. He did not reach level 50, and he never will. Even still, during his short life, he was the recipient of so much random human kindness. Even when I didn't talk to people or strike up conversation, Strangers would just appear and wordlessly hand me items that they thought I could use before running off into the distance. My messages of thanks were often just ignored, as if this person had done it out of some mechanical necessity and not as an act of generosity. That's just what you do here. You help strangers get stronger so that they can enjoy this brutal and stupid world a little more, and so they can aspire to do that kindness to others without prompting or expectation. The answer to that question from before, what reason they struggled against all this difficulty? It's the people. It's fun to learn and discover with people, even strangers. I've met lifelong friends playing EverQuest Project 1990 just in the last two years since the green server initiated a fresh start on the original video game timeline. What started as a way to connect with my younger self and with my father became getting cookies once or twice a year from a grandmother in Texas. 
became career advice from a drunken master of Discord karaoke. It became meeting a friend and his wife and kids in a downtown Tucson cafe, and it became memes about throwing boulders and sharing art and music and bad takes. There was not a single moment where my brain tingled with even a mode of fascination with the complex interlocking of game mechanics or a single instance of high action that got my blood pumping. I'm too old and games look too good now for EverQuest to have that effect on me, but I do have an endless trove of memories that I wouldn't trade for anything. Therein lies the truth of why I've played this game for so long despite the endless list of better, more beautiful games on offer. I recently visited the salon by my workplace after years of entertaining the idea casually every few months before inevitably going to one of two Supercuts franchises near my house in Tucson, Arizona. Why I wait this long between haircuts generally is between me, the therapist I can't afford, and God. But I had a realization after mustering up the courage to give the place a shot. As I sat in the chair, a soothing buzz fading in and out of my ear with the remora-like caresses of the stylist's clippers, I thought about the irony of my position. I'd avoided coming to this very convenient, well-rated establishment of what might have been laziness but was more likely a fear of coming somewhere new, of change. The longer I waited, the more my hair grew wild and disordered, the more it changed even with my inaction. EverQuest, as it is now, is alien to me. Wearing the skin of my memory with all its mystery and wonder, peeled ungracefully away by that juggernaut called time. Project 1999, in comparison to the still stirring corpse of its paid version, is no less a changed thing for all its desire to be something that once was. Its 1,000 or so concurrent denizens are all like me, probably demographically speaking, but also spiritually, using decades worth of built knowledge and lived experience with another game to play something that, to them, was once an open canvas for their minds, but is now laid bare and all too familiar. This changes how people talk to one another and how they engage with the game's mechanics, with how they move around in the world and consume the same content that they have seen over and over. That spontaneity driven by a near complete lack of easily accessible information about the game, has been overlain with the rote indifference of a speedrunner simply looking for a bottom line. EverQuest 1999 aims to reproduce something, but it cannot help but be changed by virtue of its own value to itself. The more we think things stay the same, the more our experiences will change them for us. This essay has been about EverQuest Project 1999, but it's also about looking back at things you've left behind or outgrown. I've recently been spending a lot of time thinking about what it means to be authentic to the self I am now, rather than be mired in self-made expectations and the expectations expectations of others who can't, shouldn't, have my well-being at the top of their priorities. What I concluded was that a truly authentic self can't be achieved for more than a moment at a time before what that is shifts into something new. Because growth is change, and change is the way of the world. You can't always be authentic, but you can try to be it as often as possible. In this moment, I am my authentic self, and tomorrow I will try to find another moment like this one, but likely different. The earnest pursuit of authenticity, then, is authenticity. Project 1999's thesis of true authenticity over convenience, despite the technological and informational barriers that may sit in its way, is a success from the jump. It's difficult, it's obtuse, it fails to meet our expectations about how video games of this scope are supposed to look, but it is itself, completely and unashamedly. I like to think of EverQuest as an unthinking, unblinking portrait of someone you don't see anymore. It doesn't ask anything of you, and you can't demand anything of it. It's just there to look at, think about, and remember. Thanks for watching.